Mark, you said you're bringing us to Martin Mose. I take it this is Martin Mose? This is Martin Mose. This does he, is, actually, this is his lab. Does he know we're coming? I hope so. Well, I did say something about us stopping by. Doors half open. Maybe that means we're halfway invited. Oh. Martin. Hey. What's How happening? You Frank Reese. Yeah? Yeah. You, you know told this me guy? You Martin oh, yeah. Mark. <laughs> you mind Go if we Frank. come in and shoot some urchins? <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Come right ahead. This is Blue Zoo TV, presented by Hikari, featuring Fluval. We're down in the Keys, stopping at Mr. Martin Moe's place. And Martin, you are the king of the urchins, as I've heard. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess so. Well, since Mark was nice enough to bring us in here and barge in on you, just kidding, um, give us an idea of where you're at on this whole urchin project that you've been doing okay. forever. Yeah, I, I started doing urchins instead of fish because this particular species, the long-spine diadema urchins, are the keystone herbivores of our reefs, of, of all the reefs in the, in the uh, tropical western Atlantic. And they were, most of them, 98% of them, were killed in a plague in 1983. We don't know what the cause of the plague is, or was, uh, but they have never returned. And as a result, very soon after they were gone, the reefs were covered with macroalgae, which is what these guys eat uh, in tremendous amounts. And as a result, the whole microecology of the reefs changed from coral domination to algae domination. And this in turn changed the macroecology of the reefs as well. And because they've never come back, uh, I we figured that the way to bring them back is to establish a hatchery so that we can raise them in large numbers and then put them back on the reef and then maintain the populations of them on select reef areas uh, with artificial recruitment to make up for natural recruitment. Explain, because everybody can see the spikes, what they are. Are they part of the appendage? Are they <laughs> They're a, a, long. Do they use those to move? Do they eat? How do they do uh, all that? Yeah, well, the sea urchins are you know, you've got two hours, I can tell you all about sea urchins, but they're really a very uh, amazing animal. They're, they're uh, like five million years old. These spines are protective devices. And also on the surface of the urchin, they have two other structures. They have two feet, which lets them move around. And these guys, the sea ur the, the diadema urchins, move pretty quickly and they wave their spines around. They're, they're kind of like the ballerinas of the sea urchin world. Martin, we went from the big boys, now we've got the juveniles, and there's some real small ones here. Right, right. Yeah, this is this was the first batch of uh, Tripnustes that I tried, to, that I tried to, to, to spawn. Whenever you do it for the first time, you never know what you're gonna what you're gonna run into, and you, what you learn the first time you can apply in the fu in future runs. I put about 300 of them into this tank. The growth rate between them is is just absolutely amazing. This is one right here on on the on the glass. Wow! And that's one of the smaller ones. That's about four millimeters, and this is one of this is the, one of the bigger ones, and that's like uh, almost three centimeters. So in this, in this little tank here, you got a lot going on. <laughs> That's true. Martin, can you show us the process, maybe it's not always tedious, maybe sometimes it is, of how you get the urchins to sometimes procreate? Okay, we can do that. And if they cooperate with us, which usually they do, uh, we'll get a, a, good, a good spawn. So we'll give it a try. What I found out, was that if I put them in warm water, about four or five degrees centigrade, warmer than their ambient temperature, they'll just spawn. And I don't know what sex they are. I don't know if that's Gertrude or Herman. And we'll see if these guys spawn. Yeah, oh, there he goes, yeah. Yeah, yeah the, first, the first one is spawning. Oh, wow. Yeah, he's putting out quite a bit. So the flashlight is merely to give you a better view, right, Martin? Right, see what happens inside the gonads the sperm is held in sperm crypts, and it's active and ready to go as soon as it, 
as soon as it uh, goes out. But the females, uh, the eggs are held in, a, in the ovarian tissue. And they have to, if they're not, if she's not really ready to spawn at, at, at this particular moment in time, the eggs have to mature. And they have to hydrate and they have to break loose from the ovarian tissue. And that may take 15 minutes. See, now I take the product of the, uh, of the spawn. In this case, it's a, it's a male. Then I've got sperm that I can use for fertilization in another place. Martin, how many times do you know that this has been caught on video? One. Today? Yeah. Yes, yeah, today, as far as I know. I've had still shots of some of these, but I have not uh, put this on, on video where you can actually see the so Blue Zoo is breaking ground activity. before Net Geo and everybody else, right? Yeah, yeah. So Martin, now we have sperm and we have egg. Correct. What is the next step? Well, the next step is to put them in the culture vessel. This particular system will provide an adequate substitute for the oceanic currents. And this particular culture vessel uh, allows for tre a tremendous amount of vari variation depending on the the weight and the size of the larvae, the time that they're in there. So what you're saying then basically is that Blue Zoo is now proud parents of urchins. Yeah, definitely. Mark's never going to let me live that down. There are probably about 100,000 in there at this point. I don't know if I can handle that many babies, Martin. <laughs> Martin, you're like a one-man band with this big project. Where does it go from here? Well, that's, that's a good question. I, you know, I've been working on this for about eight years now. And I've solved an awful lot of really sticky problems as far as culture of diadema is concerned. But I'm, I'm about out. I, I've gone about as far as I can go. And uh, what it really needs is an, a facility with the funding and the personnel and, and the equipment that can take this the next step, which is the large-scale production of enough juveniles where you can do experimental work with the restoration of the diadema on the coral reefs. And I'm, uh, I would love to see that happen. I would provide all the information on everything that I've done, broodstock the whole bit, to a, a, a facility, a, a project that is serious and well-funded and really wants to begin to reestablish these keystone herbivores on the coral reefs. Well, I have to say that this has been an education and the work you've done has been fantastic. And we appreciate you coming on Blue Zoo. Well, I'm happy to do so. Thank you, sir. So we're on our way doing another tough season of Blue Zoo TV presented by Hikari featuring Fluval. You guys have no idea how hard we work for you but we do. Blue Zoo TV is presented by Hikari, making species-specific diets long before it was fashionable, because at Hikari, we know it matters. And featuring Fluval, discover life below water with Fluval. Blue Zoo is proudly partnered with Carib Sea, bringing science to life. Nature protected, nature perfected with Carib Sea. To email the show, go to bluezootv.com and follow us on Twitter at bluezootv.